How many entries do we have in the basket case contest? One. It says BK1, so I can't tell. Walter, you have a basket case? A basket case. Oh. Not a home row, a basket case. Okay. Oh, where's your basket case, Walt? That's Cathedral. Oh, oh. You didn't know, right? No. How can we tell? We thought it was home room. Oh, okay. What are we doing here? Slate that up a little bit. Okay, so we have two. We, we have a contest then. We have two. Thank goodness. Um, all right, so uh, Walter is. Game two. Walter's BK2. All right, all right so we have a little problem. Um, can you bring it up here in front so that we can photograph it? Don't drop it. You think it'll be, it'll return to its basket case? <laughs> is it Harry? Is the answer? Yeah, he took it literally. Harry, you're going to say that that's it's a working radio, right? Yeah. Okay, Walter, your, yours is a working radio, right? Okay, so, because we have no electric. We will leave you. Rich, we would yes. do a favor. Ascertain if we have any further entries beside. Crystal set down here. Okay. Um, you mean to do with the homebrew? Yeah. All right. How many contestants are in the homebrew contest? One, two. Okay. Fine. That's, uh, all. Yeah. That's all. <laughs> That's all. That's all I wanted to know. Oh, okay. You feel better now. Then I will. I will. I will not pass out. Okay. Ballots, and we'll do this by show of hands. Okay. Good. Okay. Well, uh, all right, so Neville's not here, so that's what happens. And then we'll keep that so we know we keep it here first. Oh, up there, okay. Okay. Um, Harry, you're going to go first, I guess? Since you're standing? Since I'm standing, I suppose I will. Okay. You're standing? All right, so you, you need the mic or you don't? Well, I have a lot of points, but that's good. Fine. This basket case, um, I bought at a. Um, I guess one of our sales when we were still at Sarnoff. And uh, I said to Ray Chase, well, I've always wanted to work on one of these. And he said, I usually get them in better shape than that when I'm buying things. It's an Emerson BU-229, 1938, with an Ingram cabinet. Ingram cabinet, right. And here are the pictures of the before. And you can see the top is separated and the thing is all crapped up and there's no, no, no scratching and there's no, and there are chips all over it and the chassis was really crap. <laughs> it was a bucket of rust. In, uh, in an auction or what was it? Uh, it was a, yeah, it was an auction. Okay. Yeah. At Sarnoff. At, at Sarnoff, yeah. yeah. So you paid money for this. I paid oh, money for this. I thought it was somebody's wheel chalk and he drove away and left it. <laughs> <laughs> just about, just about. So I got it. I didn't get this basket then, but, uh, you know, since this is a basket case contest, I thought I had to get something in a basket because Richard said basket case. Now, um, to, now it's in it, to reiterate, or iterate, I should say, this goes and coincides with the uh, May West, yes? Uh, mm -hmm. This is uh, known as half of a half of May West. One will be. Uh, they made about they made about seven or eight models that used half a May West, and then made the one full May West. Uh, I was going to bring a May West movie tonight, but uh, I, I couldn't take it. Just bring, <laughs> to bring half the movie. You might be dry down. <laughs> so anyway. Oh. As I said, it was in crappy shape, but the worst thing was the chassis. And, um, you know, but the, here's the um, article in um, Antiquity or Classified last year that requested such entries. And uh, so, with no further ado, other than the fact that uh, you'll notice that the top had to be, uh, it was about, it, was, it had about a half an inch uh, cupping. So I had to flatten it. And I did, to, how did you do that? Uh, well, first of all, I glued the pieces back together. You can see up here the pieces were all separated. What kind of glue did you use? Naturally, I used Elmer's wood glue. <laughs> <laughs> and, but what you do, or what I did was, 
Uh, I took soaking wet rags, poured boiling water on them, and squashed it down with my clamps until right, flat. That's a hint and kink that uh, hint not kink. too many people would know about, you know, like a steam cabinet. Like a steam cabinet, cabinet. right. And it actually worked, and it uh, came out fairly decently. That part did anyway. Uh, and so it's not too bad. Uh, and it actually works. What, what I care about most is it actually works fairly decently. All right, can we start the auction with five dollars? <laughs> Three dollars. Now, the best part of this thing to see, though, is what's in the back, uh, because the chassis was really crap. What was that the mouse PP on it? No, no, just plain old, plain old rust. Boy, you can't do that. Okay, so I'll turn it around, and you can see it's no longer the rust. Um, any of you guys watch John, John Arnone do his, uh, yeah. well, let me tell you. Navel jelly. It's a good thing. Navel jelly, you know what navel jelly does? You know what four applications of navel jelly does? That melts the chassis. No, it leaves you with all kinds of pits. Uh -huh. But John Arnone says, you buy the appliance spray. <laughs> you spray it and it looks almost like a chassis. From here it does. So this is actually, uh, uh, it still has a few few minor pits, but they're all covered by um, John Arnone's uh, appliance spray. Wow! So if you, uh, it actually works. I was surprised. Uh, it's actually painted. You left the original caps in it. Uh, <laughs> the original caps were in uh, terrible shape, so I replaced it with these. Uh, there was no essentially no wiring in here. I mean, the, you know, all the. Uh, uh, grid caps were gone, and all the grid grid wires were gone, and the, uh, it, it was in pretty sad shape, uh, as you can see from the picture. But and this transformer was rusted to paint the band, as you can see over here, and is now beautiful, clean black. Again, a John Arnone trick. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the only thing I didn't do was I didn't have the other parts chrome, which he does. <laughs> Because he has a buddy in the chroming business. Uh, as I said, it actually works fairly decently. Is it a good performer? Yeah. Uh, it's a decent performer. Yeah. Yeah, I've had better. Uh, oh. better um, I, have, I have the Ray Chase special uh, wire here. Uh, the kind that, uh, and, and it was the Ray Chase special plug. Because he always, whenever I try to take anything into the museum uh, with a cord like this, he throws it out. So, so I thought that today I'd be able to do it. Uh, usually he wants a three-wire plug. Yeah. Hey, Harry? Yes? Did, did you disassemble the, the chassis? Did I disassemble it? <laughs> there was hardly a part left on it once I finished disassembling it. You're very fortunate that the cone yeah, is and, in um, good shape. Well, not in such good shape. Uh -huh. If you actually look at it, it's actually deformed. Yeah. Uh, but I and, nuts. and it wouldn't mount, and I had to make a special mount inside to uh, out, of, out of plastic to uh, actually take it. But it actually works now. Uh, still got plenty of seat. Yeah, I know it's still. Uh, what did you? Uh, the, what did you finish it with? Okay, it's finished with. Um, well, I used Minwax stain. I think I used special walnut for the basic uh, color. Then I used the uh, Mohawk. Cabinet, you read it. Yeah. yeah. Mohawk toner, and uh, probably not enough, but mo Mohawk uh, shellac, uh, shellac lacquer, uh, and then a um, little Minwax wax, and um, it came out fairly decent, as I said. How about the decals? Uh, the decals came from Radio Days. Uh, they are, except for this one, they're the same, have the same wording as the originals. Uh, this one said uh, music and voice, and now it says tone. But other than that, the decals are, are the original, so the original wording. How many hours in? Uh, probably about, I don't know, I don't even know. Weeks. 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 Many weeks. Um, so, and again, it came out pretty well. Um, and by the way, if you use Mohawk, I found out if you use Mohawk lacquer, the spray lacquer, and uh, you let the mist uh, mist on it, 
you don't spray it, uh, the bottle still spits. And if it spits, oh, yeah. it puts a blob, oh, and yeah. the blob erases, you know, your everything. This has been redone three times. Uh, but I finally got a clean, a clean layer on it. So that's it. All right, that's, that's beautiful. So this, um, I'm not going to identify it yet because you'll find out in a second that it's a little more complicated to identify this radio than it may seem. Uh, it starts back when we were in the, chur in the church. Uh, one meeting, uh, there was a chassis that was sort of left uh, in a, in a, on a table. Nobody wanted it. it. It was missing all of its tubes, or we thought it was missing all of its tubes. So uh, I think it was, I don't know, they give the club $10 or whatever it was, and it was basically this um, uh, screen grid chassis. It was pretty messy, rusty, whatever, you know. So the usual uh, thought of was, well, I'll just use it for parts, and, you know, tear it apart, it had some nice things in it. Uh, the cap was, uh, was a, 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 you know, three, three gangs. It's a TRF set. As you can see, there's no IFs in here. It's strictly 24 is a 27. Uh, and then a 45 and an 80. So it's basically, you know, like a l early 30s, late 20s design. And I really didn't know what it was. But I took it, and uh, when I got it home, I discovered that under this um, uh, metal um, uh, scri uh, 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 cover, there were three tubes. Nobody, you know, had realized that there were still some tubes in this thing, you know. <laughs> of course, two of them were bad, but that was still not a big issue. <laughs> So uh, I, I wondered whether I should, you know, maybe try to get it working, uh, or you know, maybe just, uh, as I said, uh, take it apart and just, you know, use it for parts. I didn't have a cabinet, and uh, so usually when you get a radio that doesn't have a cabinet, you know, you're kind of at a loss for figuring out whether it's going to be worth anything to do, you know, anything with it, unless you're going to make a cabinet for it. And I didn't really have the resources for that, so um, I went ahead and I re recapped it. I actually uh, restored it based on some paper that was available online. Uh, and so the radio worked, you know, it was basically um, uh, operational, it took a little money to get the 45, and, and of course the 80 is, you know, that's, those are pretty common. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, it worked, but I didn't have a cabinet. So I don't know what it was, we were at Sarnoff a couple of years later, and um, I mentioned I was looking for a cabinet for what I thought was a Glory Tone, and I think it's a Glory Tone 27. And, um, Let's see. Uh, what's the name? It was, uh, no, uh, 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 Scoba, Rich Scoba said he had, he thought, a cabinet that might actually fit this thing. So I said, well, if you have it, bring it to the next meeting. And ultimately, he did bring it to a meeting, and it was this cabinet. The regrettable part of it was that, uh, in addition to being gutted, it had been cut in the uh, front where the um, the dial fits. This had been cut out, and somebody had put like an eight-track. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, I gave him a few dollars for the cabinet. I was glad to get it, and then it sat for a number of years, waiting for some kind of inspiration to how we're going to fix this thing. And then I don't know, maybe about a year or two ago, uh, I finally got inspiration to to fix to fix this thing and put put things back together again. And basically what, what was done, and you can almost make it out now, was that I, I basically filled with wood putty and various other material, whatever I had, uh, to bring basically that whole filled area back to what looks like wood. And it is mostly wood, it's just would be wood, you know, it's, it's, it's wood filled. And then the question was, well, what are we going to do about the, uh, the scotchin? And uh, I had reached out to, in Cutstown, the guy who has the, uh, you know, the radio uh, pavilion in the, in the inside area, I forgot his name, but at any rate, he said, yeah, I think I might have a glory tone escutcheon, and, uh, but he never found one for me. And then, um, uh, I don't know, another year or two went by, or, no, time went by, actually, I don't remember how long it was, but then suddenly I came across at one, one of the swap meets this uh, creepy escutcheon, I said, you know what, I want to grab that, and, um, Henceforth, the radio was called a creepy tone. <laughs> because it's, you know. And so it took a little bit of finagling to get that to fit. I found some knobs at Gobs of Knobs. The grill 
is, um, I don't know, I have to go back to um, a couple of crappy radios that um, I got from Rick. Um, they were these like desktop, what the hell were they called? They were these um, like executive desk things, AM, FM things with the, they were kind of weird looking like Arvin, I think it was. Do you remember you gave me these? I don't know what it was. Anyway, the bottom line with these things, they were really ugly radios. You've probably seen them occasionally. They're, they're flat and uh, they have like a raised plastic area where the grill, there's two speakers in them and um, AM and FM push buttons. They were totally, you know, obnoxious looking. But I was able to salvage the grill cloth. And so what I did was I cut out the grill cloth here to put behind this grill. And it sort of looked like, you know, it might be respectable, you know. And so it's kind of a clone in that respect as well. It's not the original cloth. But, you know, it satisfies. And uh, the bolts that hold the speaker on uh, also are late model, but I tinted them to kind of give them the blend of the same, the mahogany finish here. So that kind of, you know, I thought was, was, was you know, the look and feel I was looking for. And then to refinish the one, I had some help from a uh, former member, Marty uh, Friedman, who had some magic uh, materials in his kit and was able to, uh, to refinish the, uh, uh, the wood and uh, bring back some of the imperfections uh, to make them look more respectable. And uh, ultimately now, I mean, you can plug this thing in, it worked quite well uh, for TRF. Uh, not in here, of course, uh, but uh, anywhere else. And uh, one detail also is that you, know, you can get this uh, make-believe um, uh, cloth-covered uh, 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 cable from, uh, I think I got it probably from uh, it? Radio Days, maybe. Hey, yes, yeah, maybe, but I think it was Radio Days. Has anybody ordered from there recently, by the way, Radio Days? Yeah. And how long does it take to, to get your order from? About four or five days. Because I ordered some things. I, I screwed up. Hey, here's a story I'll just tell you real quick. I have a, a work, I'm working on a, a Philco 37610 for somebody. And you know, it's a guy that's got one of those nice dials. Um, and don't do this if you, if, don't do what I did. I, the dial was, was very, very uh, uh, colorized, color faded, you know, very, very brownish, orange that they get. And it had a lot of specks of uh, mildewy dirt on it. And I went ahead and I started to wipe, and the next thing I knew, I wiped all the lettering off. And I actually had a blend of 409, Formula 409, and, and a diluted, you know, some water, like 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 two to two to two to one or whatever ratio. Don't do that. Fortunately, these guys seem to have a reproduction dial that I'm waiting for to replace that for thirty-three dollars. You know, but it was we profit. huh? It was a profit. No, I just want to get up to this. <laughs> I mean, it's part of the fun. But at any rate, so getting back to this now. So I don't know. I, you know, I, I, again, I, I was going to offer it out on the table at Precipity, but I, it's not really junk. It's just a weirdo. It's not really, um, you know, uh, uh, authentic in any way, being that it's got the wrong discussion. So works are in progress. But I thought I'd bring it tonight because it represented a little bit of uh, what we consider, you know, a basket case that kind of came together. Is that that? <laughs> <laughs> Now, you know, 50 years from now, somebody's going to buy that or swap me and go, what the hell is that? Right? It's only one. One of a kind. One of a kind. You know what's interesting, though, about these, uh, these, these late uh, TRFs is that they have pretty good selectivity. I mean, even without AFC, you know, they don't have any ABC. So you're dealing with a lot of, you know, loud stations and a lot of weak stations. And they really don't need a lot of antenna. If you play with these, you know, like if you have one that's got more than, let's say, two stages of amplification, you only need maybe a short hang, maybe six feet, I find, at least in, you know, where I live up in Edison. And I can get all the local stations and even get MTR out of uh, Morristown or, you know, that area pretty clearly. Uh, and with pretty good selectivity. Uh, but, you know, of course, it's not a superhead by any means, and it doesn't have a refinement. So you get a lot of RF from the lights, you get a lot of uh, noise from your PC and your other computerized digital devices really get a pain in the ass. As a matter of fact, I don't know, I'm really getting disgusted. A lot of people I'm working on, I'm radio for, bring them to their house, plug them in, power them up, and I get nothing but noise across the AM band. And, you know, you're kind of like, well, I worked at home, I know I work, but what am I going to do for you? I can't. And some of these guys, you know, they don't know where about radios, they don't understand the problem. And it's, going to be, it's becoming more pervasive that, you know, our hobby is in danger now from all of this other RF. I have the same problem. And then I give back another radio, an 85 plastic one, it says, hey, try this in the house. It's the same thing. I mean, you had <coughs> RF noise coming out of your, you know. Yeah. It worked fine in my house. It plugged in. It worked fine. It's working fine. Yeah. yeah. having another radio just so you can compare it. Yeah, well, it's so how do you take care of it in your house? You know, it's funny. Sometimes some bulbs and that's the issue. No, no. no. Sometimes well, no, you can. Yeah, yeah. The, the hams know how to get all that stuff out because those guys that you know, 
the ham uh, on their receivers, they got to have a lot of noise out of there. They know how to get rid of all that fluorescent noise. And, they do? Oh, and, but there's some stories in QS2, QST, which I don't read, but I had some around, <clears throat> talking about how they, the strangest things gives them noise. Like the refrigerator, the cable, yeah, cable box, uh, yeah. and they, they all have these, these detectors that they go around the whole house to pick out the RF to see the amps. Yeah, well, maybe you could put something in the newsletter about that because I actually would like to read what they're doing. And I, you know, it's a kind of a thing where it's getting, as I said, a problem. And I tried a loop antenna. Remember, he was talking about, like, Al had a thing about using loop antenna because that, that was more, it, it was a little bit better, a tunable loop, but still a problem even in that house because. Yeah, if you have a really noisy house, I don't know what, what you're going to do. Yeah. Especially, especially when you're talking about the civilians. Yeah. You know, if it were you, I'd say, you put up an outside antenna, bring it down to a ballot, and yeah. bring it in on, on TV coax and get yourself a clean signal. Yeah. But, you know, when you're talking about somebody else who just has a radio they want to listen to, I don't, don't know what the answer is there. The, the, the computer, remember the focus they used to use for computers? Did those, did those work? Yeah, just think about how many computers are in the house? Yeah, they, well, that's the problem. Yeah, no, the old days. People with problem. all kinds of devices, the whole laptops. You know, a filter will work if you're talking about detected stuff on the AC line. Mm -hmm. But if it's over the air, and then it's under the air, you have to fill the wall. The smartphone is everything. The wall? Wall? Damn. Have you ever tried to run the radio off of a generator or see if you can eliminate some of that AC problem? That's not the issue. <laughs> the issue is the issue is the interference from the RF, not the line interference. Oh, I know what you That's can do. Problem. The I know what you can do. Huh? You can build a Faraday cage around your whole house. <laughs> Darren, what do you want to say? Trouble is, trouble that I've had, and, and you know, it may not be everyone else's money, is that all this stuff that's coming out of China, the quality, the, the, there's no regulation on this. I bought a brand new charger for a cell phone. And I charge the cell phone next to my clock radio, right next to my bed. That clock radio, if you turn it on, when you, as soon as you plug that cell phone, as soon as the phone goes to charge, it starts pulling the current out of that wall. It, the radio, you know, it's, it's unlistenable. And this thing just, it's not the first time I've found one of these wall ones that just throws off so much, so much noise. I mean, well, square the distance, right? I mean, as you get further away from it, it diminishes. Yeah, so you yeah, could mess up the whole house. Everything's got switching power supplies in it now. That's yeah. part of it. Yeah. Crazy. So anyway, I mean, not to believe, I just, it's, it's an issue I've been running into, and I, I welcome any input from any of you guys, or maybe we can publish something that there's some, you know, remedy for it, other than what Al had mentioned, you know, previously about maybe using a loop. Uh, I don't really have any answers, and, and uh, you know, I'm looking for answers. So. Now, the worst of it, by the way, is below about a thousand. Uh, yeah. Up in the 1400s, you're a little better off. Yeah, H HF is not as bad, but you still can get, you know, I mean, most people have these broadcast sets. And this no, is no, no. Upper end of the band is better than the lower end of the band. Huh? Oh, yeah, you think? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. All right, well, you know, let's hope that, that at least there's some part of the band. Anyway, so that's the deal with this thing. Thank you very much for your time. All right, thank you, Walter. <laughs> yeah, why don't we... Why, why don't we put right now, and, and then somebody gets the first place plaque, yeah. and somebody gets the second place yeah. plaque. All right. You want to do a, a do yeah, show? Show, show, show us. Uh, Harry Clancer. and Walt. Mine's up for Walt, by the way. Okay, Harry's first, Walt's second. Thank you, John. Right, thank you. That was good. <laughs> okay, our next contest. Homebrew, homebrew. Who would like to be the first demonstrator? I'll go first. All right, Matt, you go first. You're you collecting All right. Can we do them up there too? Oh, um, oh yeah. Matt, Matt, could you bring it up here? Yeah, I can. That's great. Well, we've been working in place, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we believe you. Whatever you say. Now, that, that was in category two beginners. Category two beginners. What about Pete Owen? Is he in uh, category one? Beginner? Okay. Um, the 
the cover off so we can see inside, but I tried to build, I got a lot of these tins from work. We actually had a uh, marketing promotion where we gave out USB keys, and they're so old and crappy that it's better as a tin than the USB keys are. Um, so I tried to see if I could build a radio inside of this tin, but it's a little bit bigger than the Altoids can. And I try to find the easiest possible schematic Guys, pay attention, because please. I don't know how to do anything in electronics. And I wanted to do something with tubes, so I found a schematic on a Japanese website for one tube uh, radio using sub-miniature tubes. So this radio uses a 5678 Pento sub-miniature tube. And uh, I worked on it, I breadboarded it probably 50 times. <laughs> I couldn't get it to work. And I gave up and I... Uh, That's it, so thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so I called um, some experts and I called Al and brought it down to Jersey City and begged for help. And what the problem was, was the uh, toroid that I got from Al was for, it was a different toroid than what we thought it was. So the coil I built wasn't on the AM band. So when we found the other uh, toroid that was, and we uh, you know, made a new one, it worked. And it worked really well. So the next challenge was jamming all of it in this little case. So, how many stations do you hear at home? Um, on the second tap, I yeah. can hear three stations at home and on the other ones I hear different ones. So I could have probably heard about five different stations at my house. Is this a regen? I it's not a re, it's not a regenerative. I'm not sure what you would call it. But it's basically a crystal radio with a tube instead. Um great Gridley detector with that. Oh. Um it does work. I had it actually working in here even. There's a lot of static but I was able to pick up the station. Um, what station are you picking up? I couldn't. No, I, I mean to say, whichever one plays the Spanish sports station. <laughs> that does, uh, 10 that's the uh, station. Yeah. I could hear that, and I could hear Radio Disney, and some 15, 30, 15, some talk radio. You know, there's only one or two on the AM band. So. <laughs> but uh, it's a challenge getting all these batteries in here. That takes up most of the case. How many volts? Um, it's around 27 for B and uh, just one double A for the filament. Is that what the tube is rated for? Um, it's what the schematic said. I didn't look up the uh, tube data. Um, next time I'm going to use end cells or something smaller or button cells so I can try to make an even smaller radio. Um, but it does work. Well, it's the size of a Walkman now. So. You can get 15 volt yeah. or 12 volt batteries. Yeah. Those little garage door opener batteries. Yeah, I found that. The, I so. found that's what the end cells are 12 mm -hmm. volts. And uh, there's a Batteries Plus. I don't know if you guys have heard about them. Oh, so yeah. it's a quick plug. But they're a chain and they sell batteries for in, cheap. So in, I could get them for two bucks a piece. End batteries are one and a half volts. No, the end, it's the same form factor. It's the, yeah, it's the same form factor. I don't know what the actual. Yeah name of it at AGC15 or something, but they sell the holders at Radio Shack yeah, and they fit in there and they're 12 volts or two bucks a piece, so that's what I'm going to use next time. Actually, you can get a 30, you can still get the 30 volt meter batteries. Might be enough for that. They might be more expensive though. You can still get 22 and a half volt batteries too, but they're like, they're expensive. So, um, I took the cover off. I actually did put a a little bit of a graticule line on it, just a sharpie. <laughs> but it does have a headphone jack and it works with a crystal earphone. So, and I have a couple more of these pages if you guys want the schematic. And the website's on there. So as a, as a beginning builder, what did you learn from the, uh, the experience? Uh, lots of things. First of all, probably try to fit everything in before you, you know, make sure everything will fit before you actually try to build it. You ever get anything from Al? Uh, <laughs> ask everybody in the club for parts before you buy them because everybody else probably has 50 of them. Yeah. Um, what kind of coil? Is it's the... it's a toroid coil. I don't remember what alcohol. I think it's in his PGXS2 schematic. It's 50 turns of 26. Is that what it is? Yeah. It, 
Yes. And then we just tap yeah, it. Was, it was the coil from the city by its crystal set. Right, uh -huh. okay. right. So I, I just, you know, he, with his guidance, I used the same coil. Um, I was trying to use a loop stick from a transistor radio, and I had a little bit of success, but this is smaller. And I actually just got it around the shaft of the, the cap, the tuning cap, just to hold it in place. So it works. It's not pretty. Um, it looks pretty good. But uh, I'm happy and I'm proud of it. It's the first yeah. one I ever made. And you should be proud of it. Too. Yeah. You really should. Great job. Yeah. Be before Pete talks, uh, where's, where's the gentleman with the, the uh, six meter radio? You want, you want to tell him about that radio? That, that's, this is kind of cool. This, this is homebrew, but it was homebrew quite a number of years ago. <laughs> but I, I didn't know the, nice uh, job. the rules of the contest, but uh, it was something that I made hmm. years ago, probably in the 50s. Uh, during the 50s, the uh, Motorola had a little transceiver, which, which I adored, but I you know, couldn't afford it come to school. Yeah, the utility companies would huh? show up with them things. Yeah, so um, it was What's a nice little rig. I was, at the time, right up my general was a tech, tech license. So I put this thing together. I think I might have done it in high school, but I'm not sure because the handle for the receiver, which I think I borrowed this from Mark Bell, um, I might have bought this, you know, they had a break at Brooklyn Tech, so I might have done that there. But basically what it is, is uh, it's a six meter transceiver end. And what I did was, uh, on the receiving end, uh, International Crystal, International Crystal Manufacturing Company, had these little boards, these little circuit boards, transistor boards. So what I did is they had a, they had a, uh, a converter which brought everything down to the broadcast band, which is the, uh, is the board down here. So everything fed in here. Then I took a transistor radio, I took it apart, uh, mounted the uh, condenser here, mounted the audio uh, the volume control here. So basically it's just taking 50 megacycles Megahertz down to broadcast band from uh, half of, you know, 500 kilocycles to 1.6, 1.5. So that was my receiver. On the uh, the power supply was simple; it's just 10 AA cells. Tapped at nine volts for the receiver, and the 15 volts worked. I believe the I know it worked the modulator and it worked the the transmitting section. The transmitting section was basically another uh, international crystal oscillator, which had very low output. Um, and then it fed into a, a final amplifier. I don't know the transistor, but at the time, it was very difficult to get a transistor that would work at high frequencies. But I did manage to get one. And I think I homebrewed this, the final amplifier. So it's basically an oscillator feed, feeding into the, uh, the amplifier. The modulator was just an audio uh, board, also from International Crystal, which worked at 15 volts, and that was a SB modulator that modulated the final. Uh, the, uh, the controls were basically the output you could control, it, uh, the audio from the receiver worked either the earphone, it worked both, or it would work the speaker. The on off switch was here, the TR switch was here, and uh, the tunable, uh, tunable IF, I guess. You could monitor your collector current on the, uh, on the final, and you had your, uh, you know, your audio on your receiver. So, How much range did you get out of that? Not much. I think, I think the power, I was trying to figure it out today. I don't even know what, there was a possibility of three different transistors on the output, and I'm not sure which, I, I, which it is. But I think the input, I figured out, was something in the order of 400 milliwatts. Okay. So okay. what could you get into the antenna? Less than a quarter? You know, but it worked. Yeah. yeah. So. What, 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 what does it work just now? This was a transceiver for six meters, six meters? but it worked. Uh, be, six meters was between 50 and 54 kilohertz. Yeah. But because of the one, one uh, megacycle, one megahertz tunable IF, which was your, your regular receiver, broadcast receiver, so you could tune from 50 to 51. So, and that's what most people use because they wanted to stay from the high end because of TVI on channel two, which started at 56. So, so six meters. Wow.
When did he go back? I'd have to guess in the 50s. I would have to guess. I, I did a lot of stuff, but uh, Brooklyn Tech made it easier. I wish I saved everything. I think this is the only thing I saved. I kicked myself for not saving the stuff I, I built. You built that in the 50s? Yeah. You don't look that up. 77. But uh, it is what it is, you know. <laughs> Doctor, thank you for bringing it. Thank you. Okay, Pete. crystal set. Uh, I didn't know how I was going to build it, what I was going to use, uh, but I used a lot of calculations. I wanted to start with very high Q coils, because the higher Q you can get, the better it's going to work. Uh, the Q on these things is around the 920, so that's a pretty hefty Q. Each one of these coils uh, is threaded. I threaded them on a metal lathe. It's two pieces glued together anyway, machine or countersunk glued together, surfaced, and then all they're grooved here at different rates because I wanted a certain inductance in this one and a certain inductance in this one, so they're different. So this is cut like 10 turns per inch threaded, and this is about 12 turns per inch. Uh, and I pulled it nice and tight on the lathe and turned the lathe by hand so the windings stay under nice and tight. Uh, this is part. This and this are part of a pizzeria cutting board, which I couldn't see being thrown out. So I grabbed that and resurfaced it and just cut it this side. Only one piece left over, and I cut it in a diagonal because I wanted two pieces that were the same. That's why you got this kind of like, uh, art deco look to it. The uh, insulators, they're strictly for, for an afterthought. They just look neat. Uh, the tuning condensers, were, well, I found, I started using originally the non insulators in the, uh, for the stators on these things, but I found as soon as I put them on a Q meter, the Q went down and was about cut in half by using phenolic insulators. So then I had to go to ceramic varieties and glass insulator to, uh, for all these capacitors here. These main tuning ones, I only got two weeks ago with the precipitate market. <laughs> Because I, I, the ones that were here before were linear and they gave you a lousy spread. So these were real nice, and I got these from Ray Chase's uh, table. And I put them in here, and they work real nice. It's a nice even dial spread now. And it's so even, it, it screwed me up. Because now I have a different capacity, and so I had to take turns off of this one. So that's why there's an error in here. I got that to move some turns. Get it, points off for that, boy. Yeah. <laughs> I, Actually, I, I will be shaving this down, I think, just to make it look nicer. Um, I can pick up with no trouble with a 60-foot antenna, uh, West Virginia, the wheeling station. I can't think of the name of this one. In Ohio, it's always blasting through. WBZ Boston. They all come in very easily on this. What, what's your detector? Oh, it's, a, it's a 1 in 34. And all the components are hidden underneath. It's only the one thing in the pocket that I recessed underneath that uh, plastic cover. And that's where all the components are. The first thing is the choke. Yeah, a couple tiny yeah, caps. A comment here: uh, a good double tuned crystal set. You can have a reasonable antenna. You can hear everything that you can hear on a pocket radio. So, and I'm only using a 60 foot antenna, uh, and I pick up very nicely. You you can move them easily apart, and you get really a, a really you can tune it down to the surface like a gnat's ass. It's so sharp. Uh, you get it in here. It gets very broad and. Yeah, you can, it's, it's no good when you get them that close. You've got to keep them apart. And then tuning them very, very, you know, really razor sharp. And uh, that's it. I use a mill, a 1942 Navy headset. These are the sound power jobs, which are really, really sensitive. And that's why I can receive these, uh, these very low millivolt or microvolt signals on this. Uh, that's about it. Plastic, hot water can dials, and... Uh, uh, black plexiglass front panel in the face of just wood. 
sandwiched between the uh, white flash and the burner. Yeah. Did you uh, experiment with any other type of a detector? Any the no, or any no. Other I just I'd never done this before, so I but you know this is my starting one. This is my uh, my model one. Model one. Yeah. Maybe and maybe the second one will come out good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Plans for number two, but the second version is already in the works. Are there, are there two one N thirty fours, one in each section? No, just just one. That's that's here. That's the detector, the other one's the tuner. Yeah, this is the antenna tuner, and this develops all kinds of voltage. Um, it's a series cap, very very low capacitance. Uh, you adjust these series capacitance, and then a tank. So it develops all kinds of uh, voltage, and that's just picked over here. This amplifies again too. The, uh, with the Q of 900, you're going to get some a lot of voltage developed. So that's it. That's my model one. Well, I guess we didn't need Neville this evening. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Al, we have two categories, correct? Yeah. And we have an entrance for each. Yeah, well, if you count the basket case, we have three categories, and uh, I'm going to count Robert in the open category. So, you know. All right, so we're basically all winners then. Right, everybody's a winner. I'll make some of them. Yeah. All right, uh, you know, thanks, guys. Uh, it's uh, amazing what we come up with. I'm absolutely dumbfounded sometimes with some of the stuff that we uh, are able to produce in our, our little minds and our uh, time together. Um, I have a very, very short mini auction. All right? We had a uh, donation of two Zenith radios, AM, FM, over there that uh, Tom Kittridge uh, gave to the club. He donated them to the club. Um, I was told they are working, they're recapped. Um, you see that they're not in the best of shape, but they are what they are. If you happen to have a better cabinet for them, good, uh, as it is. Yeah, let, let me make a comment before you do that. Uh, I, I've been tasked with shutting down the generator. Steve Gulag uh, has to be back here early tomorrow morning, so it fell to me. Uh, so don't bottle too much or I'm going to turn the lights out on <laughs> No, no, we uh, are definitely leaving. And when we do leave, everything must go with us too. So anyway, any interest in those radios? Anybody have any interest in those radios over there? Anybody? Ten bucks? Any, uh, anybody have any other offer? No? Um, all right, anybody? Uh, uh, you did on choice. How about yeah, but well, we're doing on choice then, all right? So it's $10 for choice. Anybody uh, want to bid higher? 12 Anybody got 12 They've been recapped working. All right, $10 going once. Now you know how to align them. Twice? Your choice, Mr. Carr. All right, so we have another one, all right? Who would like that? The other one for five after Mr. Crowley uh, chooses the, the one he wants. How about five? Five dollars. Five dollars. Oh, whoa, whoa, look at that. Right. All right, John, I saw you five. Joe, seven? Scott? Nine. Nine, oh, okay. Who's got 10? Who's got 10? All right, nine dollars going once, twice. All right, Scott. Mr. Crawley first, though, okay? Yeah. All right, guys, thanks for coming. And listen, uh, June's meeting is at Princeton, June 14th. Show and tell. How? Yes. Okay, we'll go. Uh, I'm, I'm blocking someone. Okay, fine. Yeah, no.